Yes. Clapping is welcome to express God's glory and thanksgiving. Thank you, Carol, for uh, providing your gift of music today. Just a reminder, Anita, who has been gone all week and was originally planning on being back yesterday, and then her sister-in-law died, so she tacked on a, a trip to Oklahoma. So our prayers for her and her family, and thanksgiving for Carol for bringing us her gift of music today. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. Welcome to this place, this space, this time, this snowy day. Mother Nature is not done with us yet. Yes? My name is Kama Hamilton Martin. I'm the senior pastor, and it is a delight to worship with you in this space in person. Uh, or if you're joining us live on Facebook right at this moment, or if you'll watch later on either Facebook or YouTube. We invite you to uh, share with others the opportunities we have to connect and are glad uh, that we can do so together. We are gathered. I invite you to take your worship bulletin insert, take a look at what's coming up. We've got some cool things um, that we'll uh, mention. Um, quilters now with, with the snowstorm. I don't, let's see. Are quilters here? Are they planning on meeting? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Um, can always check with Jan in the office to see if they're coming, but I know they love to have new folks, visitors, or curious folks to come join them. We have uh, the men's, the Romeos are in the room and will be gathering Tuesday morning at Perkins. Ret uh, retired, now this is not my phrasing, but retired older men eating out. And so any, any guys are welcome, whether you're retired or not. But Tuesday mornings, 9 o'clock, Perkins down on uh, Colorado and I-25 there. So welcome folks to gather and to visit, to check in with each other. We have um, Thursday work crew, of course, folks are welcome to that anytime. And Saturday, is, this is Project Cure Week. So we're going to mention that a little bit more, but if you have questions, there's information on the grace notes that came in the email, and you can always invite to ask the church if you need to uh, be checking with Mary Lou and how to get involved with that. It's a wonderful mission of Grace Church. And we have an announcement to be shared this morning. Ms. Karen Snyder. Good morning. Thank you so much for all pitching in and helping. We're going to try something uh, new today. We are going to be making sacks of lunches and a few other items for the Network Coffee House. Karen Sumner is here. She mentioned that, they're, um, that we're going to be providing their lunch for tomorrow, so they'll, we'll be making 40 sacks. Whatever we have left over, we thought we would try this again next month. Like Reverend Canva says, it ties in well to communion. We're receiving bread, and then we're turning out and giving bread. There's different stations out there. If you are handling food, we just ask that you make sure you wear your mask and have your, um, we have gloves there, if you could uh, make sure you have those on. And then also at the small table, we have note cards. If you don't mind, um, maybe a couple of you just writing out some cards I have it a very generic message, such as, hope you have a good day, may this warm your heart, thinking of you, you know, something that's just a word of encouragement and a little more personalized than just a sack. So anyway, we'll see how this goes, and I appreciate everybody's help in making this come together. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Awesome. Awesome. Literally feeding, going from being fed with the body of Christ to feeding our neighborhood and our community. At this time, I invite you to stand and greet one another. Look for someone you don't know or don't know well or haven't seen in a while. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Hello. Thank you. 
question. Yes. She loved communion. Yes. It's like the highlight of her week. Oh, that's right. We need to get that girl Yay. I love to hear somebody say, I love communion and love helping to serve communion. So that's an open invitation as we are now getting further and further kind of through um, out of the primary COVID season. We're doing more things, inviting more people to be a part of things in worship. And so if that's something you would enjoy doing, we would love to uh, have you in the rotation of serving communion. Yay. I invite you to join me as printed in your worship bulletin for our opening prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, to you all hearts are open and no all desires know, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. My name is Greg Gibson. I'm the music director here at Grace. And our first song this morning welcomes us to begin this journey of Lent together. Lord, who throughout these 40 days, in our red United Methodist hymnal number 269, and you are invited to stand, to sing, or remain seated. But are you still, because I know the Spiegel Nealons are done with cookies. Do you still have remnants available? Um, yes, no? Yes. Yes. All right. So if you're looking for, we went through our primary favorite boxes very quickly. So talk to Alexa. That's awesome. A good way for us to support uh, the mission ministry. Can you tell us? What some of the things that girls, what is this like, what are some of the things that Girl Scouts do anyway, and why should we care? Camp. What do you do at camp? S'mores. S'mores. <laughs> do you learn anything? Yeah, we learn about, sometimes you learn about the stars, you learn about like, wildlife, you go on hikes. Stars, wildlife, hikes, leadership. Development, I think, Girl Scouts are, so we're very glad to be able to support you. That's just one of the things that's happening inside the church building. That's awesome. Good morning, family. You made it through the snow today. Yes. So I was thinking about journey this morning as I was watching the cold and the snow outside. Does it, do you all have boots on? I was not very smart. I didn't put real boots on today. But, um, but. When you go on, we're going to be going on a journey starting today with people who follow Jesus all around the world, whether it's Methodist churches or Catholic or Orthodox or all kinds of churches and faith communities of all sizes and shapes all over the world. Today is a day that Christians or followers of Jesus are starting a new season, we call it a season. And um, can anybody tell me what the color of the season might be? <laughs> Purple? <laughs> yes. 
Yes, purple is the season. And this beautiful scapular um, I inherited from my stepmom when she retired. And so you're going to see a lot of things in purple the next few weeks. Um, why would purple, what is purple a color for back in the ancient world? Royalty. You got it, Alexa, right off the bat. So if you think of something that was really, if somebody was really um, respected or royal or somebody that you were, that might have money that most of the normal people didn't have to get special cloth, purple cloth, then, um, so purple is a color for royalty. And sometimes, have you ever heard Jesus uh, called uh, Lord? Is that a word you've heard? Lord? We sometimes use it in prayers or songs. And so that's a, one of the reasons we use purple for Lent, is to remember that, that Jesus as a part of God's presence with us in the world. Um, this Lent is a time for us to think about him, and we're going to hear stories about what Jesus did, and then we're going to ask, well, how does my life, why should, how does my life do that? So today is a great story. Has anybody ever been tempted by anything? <laughs> Everybody looking out there? Uh-huh. Anyone? Anyone? Can you think of something that you have ever been tempted by? Have you ever walked into the kitchen with a plate of beautiful cookies and thought, hmm, I know it's almost supper, but maybe nobody will notice? Or, I don't know, that's something that comes to mind. Anybody else? Has there ever been a, temp a temptation of something that you've thought about doing, but then you think, well, Maybe not. Or maybe you do it. And then you have to think about it later. Anybody? Hmm. Those are things that aren't easy to fess up to, huh? Well, this week, I'm going to invite you to hear this story of Jesus. Because Jesus, as much as we lift him up as Lord and presence of God on earth, he also went through a very some very um, serious temptations of things. And he had to decide... If I do this, is it going to benefit me, or is it going to benefit everybody else? And so I invite you to listen and to hear and maybe put yourself in the story and think about um, this week. What are some things that you might have been tempted with? Uh, sometimes, um, I don't know if you sit by people now in your classrooms, but I remember growing up, there was a big temptation that some people had in the classroom at school of, you know, if we were taking a little quiz or a test and a Looking over and seeing what my neighbor was doing. So there may be all kinds of things that you're tempted to do that is very normal. And we're going to hear how Jesus heard about that and what he did. And as a result of that story, that might be something we can take with us. So I'm going to invite you to stand and kind of make a little semicircle here. And it's so good to see you all. Uh, welcome, and we're going to invite everybody to pray together. So I invite you just to repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who comes to show us who you are. Even Jesus was tempted, and we are too, O oh God. So bless us this week. Help us to think about ways. Help us to think about ways. We can be your body to the earth. We can be your body to the earth. In grace and love. In grace and love. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much.
Good morning. My name is Douglas Morton. First of all, good morning. My name is Douglas Morton. Our Bible reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. The first three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke each have a version of this story, which is the traditional reading on the first Sunday in Lent. I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Verses 1 through 13. I invite you to follow along in your bulletin insert and join me in the bolded, underlined print. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you, then, will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Here ends our reading. Thank you, Doug. Here we are, first Sunday in Lent. Purple abounds now. Our altar folks put white on today because it's Communion Sunday, but they'll be full purple everywhere uh, next week. And so as we gather, friends, we're beginning this journey 
May we open ourselves to God's leading and learning from the scriptures and in our reflections this day. So have you ever been in a conversation as a child or a youth or a young adult or maybe an older adult? Or have you, do you remember being um, that person either asking or having it asked of you? So Alexa, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, an actress. An actress. Excellent, excellent. We'll check back with you in a little bit and see how that goes. Have you ever been a part of those backs and forth? So what are you going to do when you grow up? Well, who knows? Various answers, maybe depending on the day, depending on how you feel. And that is a part of the question for us and for Jesus today. So this morning we begin the season, the journey of Lent. It's one of those times in my personal and corporate spiritual life that I love because it reminds me that we are connected to followers of Jesus of every land, every ethnicity, every color, every age, every language, and, and that this is a season that people will be on this path with Jesus together. It's a very powerful thing to think about. And we begin, like Doug said, this story is the first Sunday of Lent story. And so our songs today are going to reflect that. And they're questions posed to Jesus. Jesus, what are you going to be when you grow up? Who are you? Jesus is 30 years old, the story says. And in his culture, that means you're, you're an adult now. It's the age of adulthood, the age of accountability, when one was supposed to be looking to settle down and marry and work, get to work and raise a family. And like Jesus, many of us may be pondering that question today. What are we going to do when we grow up? In Luke's gospel, this um, before what Doug read today, before the temptation, what has just happened in Luke's John gospel chapter 3, Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. That wonderful scene, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove, a voice is heard saying, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Oh, great, dramatic. And then Luke pauses for a genealogy of names. And then chapter 4 starts. <laughs> so we have this baptism, this wonderful spiritual experience spiritual experience. And chapter 4 then, Jesus is sent out. And I've wondered, I've heard some, um, some of us of a certain age, Gen Xers and older, who remember in the summertime, now that it's starting to get a little lighter in the evening, in the summertime, you'd be kicked out of the house and you'd be told to come back for supper. Anybody else? Remember those days? Go out, entertain yourself. Don't be stupid. Don't hurt yourself. But get out of here. Right? And there is a whole, there are generations of kids that have no idea what that feels like. <laughs> and so this is what, this is what Jesus is doing. Go out, get out there. He is driven, the scripture says, by the spirit. So God is with him, even in this time of tempting and, and uh, testing. And I love it. Here we have the main character. So Alexa, as an actress, there's going to be lots of characters on the stage or on the film. Right? And this is one of the characters that when they come out to this on the side and the curtain opens and the audience goes, Boo! Who is it? The devil. Tu Diablo. Here's our Greek lesson for today. It's a great word. Tu Diablo. Can you say that? Tu Diablo. Tu Diablo. The slanderer. The devil. The tempter. One whose role in the Bible is to tempt and to test at this critical time of Jesus' life. Who am I? What am I supposed to do? And of course, that length of 40 days, anybody catch that? 40 days in the wilderness? The Bible is full of 40 days, 40 years, the number 40 being a number of meaning a whole long time, whether it's the flood or the children of Israel wandering through the desert. So the people who would have seen and heard this story would have thought, oh, man, Jesus was out there a long time. Yeah. The slanderer, the, the devil, the tempter acknowledges Jesus' status. 
in our translation it says, um, it may, some translations may say, if you are the son of God, if you are uh, God's son. But the word, the Greek word also means since. So if you see that in your bulletin insert, translate and put since, since you are the son of God. So the tempter is not, not uh, the tempter knows who Jesus is. Right? The tempter knows who, who we are when we have those uh, times of temptation. And that first suggestion, Jesus, is very literal and very pragmatic. And as a mission-oriented church that tries to help feed people, I think, well, that would have been an okay thing. Turn these stones into bread. How many people could that feed? Jesus was famished, we're told. Surely it would not be evil to make some bread for himself, would it? But Luke seems to intend for us to understand that these temptations are about more than satisfying Jesus' own needs. They're also symbolic of what kind of Messiah is this guy going to be? What is this process for Jesus? What, how is he going to come out on the other side? So he's tempted first to provide for people's physical needs. This was a land where famine was frequent. Poor people were hungry even in the good years. And in that situation, a Messiah who would make bread from the abundance of stones would be a good thing, wouldn't it? And then the slanderer, boo, to Diabolu, suggests that Jesus should worship him. And in exchange, Jesus, you'll get all the glory and the honor over all the kingdoms of the world. Well, what's wrong with that? What if everybody was able to look to Jesus as Lord and to follow? Well, it may seem a little more obvious to us, but again, what in Jesus' time and place and the first readers of these gospel stories, Israel at this time was occupied by Rome. Rome laid heavy taxes and burdens on the people, and just the fact that the Roman emperor ruled the people of Israel could be seen as an obstacle to God's reign of justice and peace. If Jesus' vocation is to bring the kingdom of God, maybe he's supposed to do it with the political power. But Jesus again says no. And finally, to the pinnacle of the temple, he goes, throw yourself down. Of course God will save you. You're not going to be harmed. And it would be a great acting scene, and it would cause a stir among the residents of Jerusalem. They'd probably be more receptive to the words that you would speak, Jesus, more likely to believe that you are who you claim to be. But Jesus says, no. These aren't easy questions for Jesus. We can simplify this passage and think, well, Jesus is just doing God's will. He's just doing what he's supposed to, doing the right thing. But Jesus is not simply choosing between a good thing and a bad thing. And that's part of the depth of, these te of the testing. As it happens to us too. Jesus is choosing between one good thing and another good thing. Feeding hungry people is a good thing. Freeing people from political captivity, hello Ukraine, is a good thing. But Jesus chooses not to do those good things in that way, in that moment, so that he can do something else. In each of these testings that the Diablo proposes, there is a question about the kind of Messiah. Who are you, Jesus? Who are you going to be? What are you going to do when you grow up? And each kind of Messiah reflected in those questions was a, a kind of Messiah that the Jewish people were looking for. Some people were expecting another prophet like Moses, someone who could provide manna for them. Bread? Yes? Someone who cared for them in the wilderness. Jesus could have begun his messiahship and doing something like that. Others expected a political leader like King David. Someone who could bring people, uh, bring freedom to the people from the rule of their enemies. Establish a reign of justice and peace. Wouldn't we all love that? Jesus could have done that. 
And then there were those who were hoping that the Messiah would come as a righteous and pure and holy priest. One rabbi taught that when the king, the Messiah, reveals himself, he will come and stand on the roof of the temple. That's exactly what the two Diablo wanted Jesus to do. These forms of leadership, these kinds of leaders God had used previously to guide the people in Israel and what they had come to expect of the Messiah, and Jesus had to deal with those expectations. What about you? We can all struggle with what others expect of us, either what they tell us they expect of us, or what we infer or assume they expect of us. One of the gifts of this passage is this is showing us a very human Jesus. Not just that he was tempted or tested, but that in that temptation it was to fulfill what others expected of him. And I would guess that for many of us we could align with that experience, that feeling. In our lives every day we make choices. Choices about whether we will or won't fulfill other people's expectations. And there's all kinds of ways we might hear that. Well, if you were really committed to your job, well, if you weren't so tired all the time, well, if you were really a Christian, if you really believed the Bible, you would do this. If you loved your children, if you were really my friend, any other blanks you want to fill in? We often give in to the temptation to let others determine who we will be. And that temptation is dangerous because other people don't always know us as well as they think they do. Can I get an amen? amen. Thomas Edison's teachers told him, said that he was too stupid to learn anything. Albert Einstein's teacher described him as, quote, mentally slow, unsociable, and adrift forever in his foolish dreams. He was expelled and refused admittance to the Zurich Polytechnic School. A football expert said Vince Lombardi had only minimal football knowledge and he lacked motivation. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln lost four races for election to Congress before he became president of the United States. When we build our lives around what others expect, we may hear their messages and we may not have the courage to attempt what maybe the still small voice inside of us has. To overcome that temptation to do what is expected or what others name, we can look to Jesus' example. And he does two things for us as we kick off this Lenten journey that we might think about this week. First, he goes to the wilderness, another deep image that's in the Bible, wilderness, desert, it's the same word. In Jewish tradition, the wilderness was a place of contact with God and a place also, by the way, where the wild beasts and the demons might be. This wilderness seems to be both for Jesus as well. He's led by the Holy Spirit and also tempted by the tempter, Diablo, the, the slanderer, the voice of, of the devil. So Jesus goes. What does he feel? He's just been baptized. He's had this amazing spiritual experience. And what does he do? He does uh, a, a spiritual practice that many people do today, fasting. Jesus' fast is an indication of the seriousness of his purpose in the wilderness, the intensity of his focus. He spends time alone, attending to only his most basic needs for survival. And when the devil presents these temptations, Jesus has to seriously consider whether the people's expectations of a Messiah are really what he should be about. So in going to the wilderness... Jesus takes time to pause, to listen, to be quiet. That's a hard thing for us to do in our culture on any day. When we are tempted to fill everyone else's expectations, is there a way for us to go to the wilderness? When we are worn out for trying to do it all, can we go to the wilderness? When we begin to think others were right when they said we couldn't do it, and we go to the wilderness and perhaps discover or rediscover who it is that God created you to be, 
Like Jesus, we all need space and time in the wilderness. So Jesus enters the wilderness, but also the second thing Jesus does is he says no. He says no to good things. Many of us can struggle in our lives with saying no. Our culture reflects this. We say, remember Nancy um, Reagan, just say no. It was a, an attempt to work with kids on a very serious issues in our culture with drugs and alcohol. But we still have rampant abuse and addiction. Time management gurus tell us to learn to say no, but we still have overworked, worn out, burnt out executives and teachers and nurses and students, teenagers and moms and dads and church members. So what does Jesus know? How does that connect with us? Jesus says no to three potentially good ways of being the Messiah in order to say yes to something else. And you and I may have these defining moments at different times in our lives. As we pass through various stages of childhood, youth, young adults, adult, aging, leaving home, school, learning, vocation, work, relationships, family, retirement, as well as when we deal with crises, illness, unemployment, grief. There's the potential for a moment like this one, a time when we discover or rediscover who we are and the invitation to live that out in the knowledge of God's grace. Moments when we consider, what can I say no to so that I might say yes in other ways. So here we are, friends, this first Sunday in Lent, an opportunity to consider this story. I hope you'll take this home and read through that story through the week, an opportunity to consider goals for our lives or just even for today. This first week of Lent, may we enter the wilderness, find moments or places to turn off the external noise of life to give ourselves a chance to hear or to feel or to experience the holy around us. And secondly, to look at our lives at things, even good things, that perhaps we could say no to or not yet or not anymore in order to say yes to life relationships, to health, to God, and to your innermost self. Our Lenten journey begins. May we embark on it together, supporting one another, with Jesus leading the way before us. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to turn now. One of the things we're going to do through Lent is each Sunday, in the back of our worship hymnal, I invite you to turn to page 880. And we're going to um, connect with some of our uh, affirmations of faith, some of which are called creeds. So today we will begin with an ancient creed of the church. In some churches, if you go to um, Catholic churches a lot and others, they may say a creed uh, or an affirmation of faith every single week. So we're going to dip into this, into a bit of our heritage the Nicene Creed came, uh, is named after the Council of Nicaea in 325 that Emperor Constantine uh, got folks together. That's Nicaea is in northwest Turkey on our maps. It was revised a little bit in 381 by the Council of Constantinople into the form that we have today. The Nicene Creed sets forth key affirmations concerning the Christian faith, and it is the second oldest of, uh, creed of the faith after the Apostles' Creed, which we will also share in. It talks about um, Christ uh, about as, the divi as divine and as co-eternal with God. And as we pray these creeds or, or share them, there may be words or phrases that we think, what does this mean? Every word that is crafted in these is often a response to some of the differing opinions and things that were bubbling up in the early centuries of the church. So this is one of those. So let us 
Take a breath. Whew. There are people who have this memorized. I do not anymore. So, 880 in our hymnal. Let us pray together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Whew. Couple things before we move on. Remember that in these creeds, the word Catholic is with a small c. It does not refer to the Roman Catholic Church. It refer, it's a word that means universal. And I just wanted to point out one of the big things theologically in the Nicene Creed that we heard a couple is the word begotten. That Jesus was not, that Jesus Christ was not made by God. Jesus was begotten. It's, it's a whole theological thing you can, you can uh, read about that we're not going to go into, but um, that sense of begotten, not made, a God from God, of one being um, with the Father. So that was a big deal in the Nicene Creed. So there we have a bit of our connection with our history this day. I invite you to take a breath and to join me in an attitude. O oh God of us all, on this first Sunday Lent we come with hesitant steps and uncertain motives to sweep out the corners where sin has accumulated, to uncover the ways that we may have strayed from your guidance. Expose any empty and barren places that we don't want you to enter. Reveal our half-hearted struggles where we have been indifferent to the suffering of others. Nurture the faint stirrings of new life where your spirit begins to grow. Let your healing light transform us into the image of your Son. For you alone, O oh God, can bring new life and make us whole. Gracious God, we lift up your children in Ukraine and other areas of violence and conflict. We are all yours, O oh God, and we pray for wisdom discernment, and healing of hearts and policies that life may continue and tyranny may cease. This week, O oh God, we pray for Jim and Donna Glasscock and family as they prepare to honor the life of their son this next Saturday, March 12th. And now in silence, receive these prayers, which remain in the depths of our hearts. Let us lift our voices together in the prayer Jesus taught, printed in your bulletin, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Grace is a missional church, 
And as Karen has talked about, today's ex new experiment uh, of, of creating lunches for Network Coffee House. May you know that being a part of the Grace community means sometimes feeding people literally with bread. And sometimes it is uh, with support through agencies like Family Promise. And sometimes it is uplifting hearts with ministries like our bell choir. Um, so, Gerardo, would you just stand? I don't know if everybody knows who you are. Gerardo, our Grace Ringers bell choir director. And I would just say, it looked like there might be some spots if there was a person that wanted to come join the bell choir. I don't know, just saying. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Thursdays, 6.30, and you can look for uh, Gerardo after worship if you have any questions or see any of the good folks that you saw ringing the bells. It's, a, it's an amazing ministry that we have. And so we give thanks that we are able to be in ministry and mission together. If you have physical offerings today, we invite you to place them in the plates at the end of the center aisle. You can look on the back of your bulletin for electronic options that are easy to do. And if you ever have problems or questions, be uh, sure to call the office or let me know. And we're going to today bring back a sung response of for as we think about giving of ourselves and our offering of our tithes and our offerings to God. So if you wish to stand, you may. If you wish to sit and sing uh, with gusto, you may. But we're going to sing our doxology. Remember from last week, doxal, doxologos, words of glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus was arrested, he took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to his friends, his community, and said, Take and eat. May this be to you as my body. Whenever you eat of it, may you know that I am there with you. In body, in spirit, in connection with God. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, Jesus took another cup of wine, gave thanks for the fruit of the vine, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of a new commitment, a new covenant, a new community in God's name and in my love. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in, pra in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I would invite our servers to come forward. Holy Communion in the United Methodist Church is open to all who wish to receive it, regardless of age or membership. And if you would like to be served in your seat, we will, um, we will ask that and, and we'll be glad to come to you. We have um, bread with a toothpick, so you can grab the toothpick and have it. We have uh, unfermented wine, Welch's grape juice, in little cups. You may put your trash in, and we have gluten-free. So please come. Uh, the ushers will dismiss and invite people forward a little bit at a time, invite you to come on the outer aisles and return to your seat in the center. Please come forward. The feast is spread.
Will you join me in our prayer after communion? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Our final song is based on the Lenten theme for today, Jesus Tempted in the Desert, in our Black Faith We Sing book, number 2105. We invite you to stand or remain seated and sing along.
uh, would love to have folks help uh, put uh, together medical supplies that are sent all over the world. It's a wonderful monthly ministry we have. You do need to register ahead of time. They have an online registration. So please um, do that and let us know if you uh, have questions about it. Also want to say farewell. Gar uh, Gary and Patty are getting ready for a month in Texas. Is that right? Yes, so uh, say farewell and Godspeed and enjoy the weather. And now, beloveds, we gather to worship, we depart to serve. Our Lenten journey has begun. Go now, knowing that God is with you. Go to, to learn, go to teach, go to serve. Enter the wilderness and discover how you might say no in order to say yes. Go bringing peace and hope to all in the name of Jesus Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all of God's children said, Amen.